Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. So today's lecture will be on bifurcation theory, which is a very important topic in the theory of dynamical systems. And it's part one of a two-part uh, series. So uh, what is this about? Well, let me start with an example, which is the so-called logistic map. So I have a map here defined on the real axis, where x is mapped to lambda times x times 1 minus x, and lambda here is a parameter. So lambda could be any real number, let's just say it is positive. So here you have the plot of uh, the graph. So it is uh, 0 in 0 and 1, its maximal value is reached in 1 half, and uh, it has the value lambda over 4. And the main question we ask in dynamical systems is how does, how do the iterates of this map change when lambda changes? So what I mean by iterates is that I fix a certain x naught in R, and then I define a sequence of xn, where n are integers starting in, in 0 defined by xn plus 1 is equal to f lambda of xn. And what happens as n becomes large? Does it converge to some value? Does it do something more complicated, maybe even chaotic? And this will in general depend on the value of lambda. So uh, first thing we can do for this kind of, uh, of system is to look for fixed points. So fixed points are uh, points such that xn plus 1 is equal to xn. And this means that xn, or maybe x0, should be equal to x star, where x star is equal to f lambda of x star. So this is, uh, by definition, a fixed point. Now, let us look at this equation in, in this particular case. It is uh, quite easy to, to study. So I'm looking at the equation x star is equal to lambda times x star times 1 minus x star. And if I rearrange this a little bit, I, I get lambda x star squared plus 1 minus lambda times x star should be equal to 0. Now, this is a quadratic uh, equation which has two solutions that are quite simple to find. So one of them is x star equals 0 and the other one is x star is equal to so lambda minus 1 over lambda, which I can also write as 1 minus 1 over lambda. So these are uh, two so-called equilibrium branches. So it means that for every lambda I have these two uh, different fixed points, which are different unless uh, lambda is equal to 1. And we can uh, plot them. So here is a, is a plot of these uh, fixed points in terms of lambda. So one of them is uh, maybe not so easy to see, it's, uh, it's the axis here. And the other one is this curve uh, with a horizontal asymptote at 1. Now the second question we may ask for such a system is about stability. So what we do then is to say uh, what happens if I start not exactly at x star but a little bit nearby. And my f here is a nice polynomial so I can actually expand this or in more general cases I can use a Taylor expansion. So if I do that I find that this is f lambda of x star 
plus y times the derivative f lambda prime of x star plus a second order term and let me just write it that's Landau's notation big O of y square even though for this particular example we can actually compute it you can see that it is always minus y minus lambda times y square Okay, and now what we observe is that by definition of a fixed point, f lambda of x star, that is equal to x star. And this here, I can also write as y times f lambda prime of x star plus a remainder of order y. And now the observation is that if f lambda prime of x star, so the derivative f of x star in absolute value is strictly smaller than 1, then this term here uh, will lead to a contra contraction. And if y is small enough, the contracting part will dominate. And uh, it means that after one iteration, the distance to x star will be smaller and it will keep getting smaller and that means that in this case the point is stable. And otherwise if the derivative is uh, larger than 1 strictly then I will have expansion, so my point will be unstable. And I gave in another talk a precise definition of what we mean by stable and unstable. Now, uh, let us look at what happens uh, in our case. So, first of all, what is f lambda prime of zero? So, uh, so maybe first let us compute f lambda prime of x. And that is equal to lambda minus 2 lambda x. So f lambda prime of 0, that is equal to lambda. And remember I restricted here the discussion to positive lambda. So what I have, have here is that this branch at 0 is stable up to 1 and then it becomes unstable. With a transition at 1. And what happens at 1 is in general a bit more difficult to, uh, to study. That will depend on higher order terms. How about the other point? So f lambda prime of 1 minus 1 over lambda. Well, if you plug this in here, what you find is 2 minus lambda. And so you see that if lambda is smaller than 1, this is bigger than 1. So the part down here is unstable. And then when lambda increases, beyond 1, this becomes uh, smaller than 1, but at some point it will become smaller than minus 1. And actually that happens when lambda is equal to 3. So what happens is that up to lambda equals 3, this branch is stable, and then from 3 on it is unstable. Now, bifurcations are these phenomena here. So, for instance, here I have a bifurcation. So, bifurcation here is synonymous to intersection or crossroad. So, it means that something happens, something changes in, in the system. Like here, we have different branches of equilibria that intersect. However, <coughs> this point here is also called a bifurcation. 
even though we only see one branch of fixed point. So the question is what happens here? So here's just a, a plot of these uh, different types of stabilities with bifurcation points here and here. So just to to be a bit more precise what we mean by bifurcation in a dynamical system that is particular values of the parameter which is called lambda here at which the behavior of the system changes and it changes because as we have seen here the zero branch is attracting here the the other branch is attracting it is stable while this one is unstable, this one is unstable, and this one is unstable. So at lambda equals 1 and lambda equals 3, uh, something happens. Now, what happens at lambda equals 3? We can analyze in more detail. So let us look at uh, the map again. So what I actually claim is that at lambda equals 3, we have appearance of an orbit of period 2. So what does it mean? So uh, first of all let us recall that we have this map f lambda that maps xn to xn plus 1 and I am going to work with yn so I'm going to write xn is my x star of lambda plus yn so it's a change of variables and this x star of lambda is this 1 minus 1 over lambda. And I'm interested in the map in the new coordinates y here. So how do I find the map in the new coordinates? Well, I just write that xn plus 1, so x star plus yn plus 1. That is xn plus 1. And that is, uh, by definition, lambda times xn times 1 minus xn. And now I reply, replace xn on the right-hand side by x, its exp expression in terms of lambda. So that is lambda times x star plus yn times 1 minus x star minus y n. And let me expand this and uh, collect powers of y n. So if I do that I get the following things. So first a constant term, then a term proportional to y n. and a final term proportional to yn squared. And by definition of the equilibrium branch, the constant term is equal to xn. So, so uh, to x star in fact. And this one here, we have computed before, that is uh, 2 minus lambda, that's actually the derivative, and let me call it A for simplicity. So the conclusion of this little computation is that yn plus 1 is equal to A times yn minus lambda times yn squared. So I have found the expression of my map in the new coordinates. Now, what I want to do is to compute yn plus 2. So, of course, it's the same 
thing with n replaced by n plus 1. But now let me replace yn plus 1 by its expression in terms of yn. So I get this thing here. So the first part, uh, which is linear in yn plus 1, and the second part, which is quadratic. And now I can expand this, and I get a certain polynomial of order 4. And let me just write the result, because the computation is not so interesting. And it turns out I can factor out the power of yn. And then I get here a certain polynomial of degree 3. So let me just write this polynomial. So quadratic term and cubic term. So now I'm interested in orbits of period 2. So I, I want this to be equal to yn. Right? Because if yn plus 2 is equal to yn, it means that I will return to the same point every two iterations. And we see that there are, there are two possibilities. So the first possibility is just to have yn equal to 0, because then yn plus 2 will be equal to 0. And uh, But this we already know. It's just my equilibrium branch, 1 minus 1 over lambda, the one up here. And it's, of course, since it's a fixed point, it's also an orbit of period 2. But the, the other one, which is uh, more interesting, is when this bracket here, so the bracket that uh, we have here, this thing here, is equal to 1. Because then yn plus 2 will be equal to yn as well. Now this gives us a certain equation of degree 3. And actually we know already one solution because the, the other branch, which, which was x equals 0, which now leads to some non-zero y, is uh, a fixed point. But to see uh, what happens, we are interested in lambda close to 3. So therefore let us write lambda is equal to 3 plus mu. So mu is a new parameter, and use the expression for a, which is here, and plug in, and then, uh, so expand, and let me just write the result. So this condition here leads to a condition which looks like 2 mu plus 3 mu y minus 6 y square plus h o t for higher order terms. So these are terms which are of order mu squared and uh, some uh, monomials of degree 3 and higher order. So this should be equal to 0. And now what you see is that actually it's possible to uh, to solve this for for y, and you find uh, so again it's if we neglect the higher order terms here, which we will be able to justify later on. So what we get then is that y has to be equal to plus minus mu over square root three plus. Uh, it is square root of mu over square root of 3 and plus something of higher order, uh, which is of order mu. 
But this is possible only if mu is positive. So the conclusion of this computation is that if mu is positive, so if lambda is larger than 3, there are two uh, new uh, fixed points of f lambda iterated with itself, composed with itself, and this leads to an orbit of period 2. And that means that lambda is larger than 3. So this is what happens at the second bifurcation point, lambda equal to 3. It's the appearance of an orbit of period 2. So here is a, is a picture of what is called the bifurcation diagram. So here I have just zoomed on the interesting part. So lambda equals 3 is somewhere here. And what we have just described is the following point here. So how is this uh, picture obtained? Well, it is obtained by plotting a collection of large iterates. So what you plot for several different nearby values of lambda is xn. So it's xn for n equal to, uh, I think it's 1001 to uh, 1100. Because you expect that uh, for n this large, if the system has some asymptotic behavior, it will be very close to it. And indeed, so uh, to the left of 3, we have this stable branch that we have seen before. So that is the stable branch x star of lambda equal to 1 minus 1 over lambda, which exists also for larger lambda, but it is unstable. So here it has become unstable, so we don't see it. And here we have this, these uh, two new <coughs> points of period 2. So what the system does here is that asymptotically it jumps between two values here. And then actually you have more bifurcations. That's the most interesting thing about this <coughs> system here. And you don't really uh, see it, but it is, uh, you have more and more of these so-called period doubling bifurcations. So all these purple circles here denote what we call period doubling or subharmonic bifurcations. And there's something interesting going on uh, because there's actually an infinite number of bifurcations here, and that is the so-called Feigenbaum scenario of period doubling cascade. But uh, this is not the topic for today. I <coughs> may speak about it another time. All right, so, so that was our main example. Now, let us come back to uh, more general situations and first of all let me comment that there are two cases we can look at which are very similar but slightly different so what i've talked about so far is the case of an iterated map so xn plus one is some function f depending on the parameter lambda of xn and we have looked at fixed points which are defined by xn plus 1 equal xn and that is equivalent to having xn equal to x star where x star is equal to f lambda of x star and uh, that is also equivalent to asking that f lambda of x star minus x star is equal to zero. And we've also seen that if the derivative at x star is less strictly than one, then 
our fixed point will be stable, meaning that if I start sufficiently close to x star, I will actually remain close to x star and even converge. So it's stable and it's actually what we call asymptotically stable. Now, there's another situation which is quite similar, which is the situation of an ordinary differential equation. So that is an equation of the form x dot is f lambda of x. And here, the x dot is actually the time derivative of x of t. So uh, I can write the t-dependence, usually we don't do it. So that's an ordinary differential equation for x. And the object which is uh, analogous to a fixed point is what is called an equilibrium point. And an equilibrium point is a solution, so it's a point such that x dot is equal to zero, so it means that f lambda of x star should be equal to, to 0, and uh, I take this x equals x star as initial condition. So it's a solution that remains at the same point. And how about stability? So uh, let us assume that I have such uh, an equilibrium point, and let me look at f lambda of x star plus y. So let me assume I start nearby, so y is non-zero but small. And again, assuming that f lambda is uh, sufficiently nice, I can tailor expand this, and the constant term is zero because of this condition here, and then I get f lambda prime of x star times y plus a remainder of order y squared. And now you see that this system is stable if and only if, well, at least a sufficient condition for being stable is that f lambda prime of x star is strictly negative. Then I know that my system will be stable asymptotically. So you see the condition for being stable is slightly different, but apart from that, uh, in both cases, I have to solve an equation where some function of x in lambda is equal to zero. Now, as I said, in these bifurcation problems, the main question we ask is, how does the behavior change with lambda? And the most important result in, in this respect is called the implicit function theorem. So it says the following thing. So let f be some function from R2 to R, so the arguments are x and lambda. And let me assume that it is continuously differentiable. So there's a precise definition for that. What it means is that basically I can compute derivatives with respect to both arguments, and uh, these depend, these are again continuous functions. So although the exact definition is a little bit more precise than that. And then let me assume that I have found a particular point x not lambda not at which f is equal to zero. So I have found a particular fixed point for a particular value of lambda, which is lambda not. And then let me assume that this particular derivative, the x derivative of f at this point is different from zero. So it's a kind of non-degeneracy condition. And the implicit function theorem says that if this is true, then there exists near lambda equals lambda zero a unique function which is continuously differentiable. So lambda maps to x star of lambda 
such that I have two things. So first of all, x star of lambda naught is equal to x naught. And most importantly, f is equal to zero at any point of the form x star of lambda lambda. And in addition, we have an expression for the derivative of x star with respect to lambda at point lambda naught. So uh, what does this result mean? So what this means is that by finding this x star of lambda on which f uh, is equal to zero, it means that we have in a way solved the equation f of x lambda equals zero with respect to x. Right, so x star of lambda solves f of x lambda equals zero with respect to x. So let us look at an example maybe before looking at uh, consequences of that. So uh, my example would be f of x lambda is equal to x square plus lambda square minus 1. Now I've chosen this example because actually we know what the solutions are. So let me plot so lambda on the abscissa and x on, on the ordinate. I know that this is actually the equation of a circle of radius 1. So let me try to draw this circle so it looks something like this, more or less. So it's a circle of radius 1. Now what this result tells us is that assume we, have, we don't know that the solutions are points on the circle, and, but we observe we have found a particular solution. So we observe that f of 1 0 is equal to 0. So 1, 0, so, okay, be careful, I've switched the, the axis, so 1, 0 is the point here. So that's x equals 1, lambda equals 0. And I ask, how about lambda close to 0? Is there a, a solution of my equation here? And, of course, we see that this is the case on the picture. But if we apply the theorem, so, okay, first of all, what is the derivative of f? Well, that is simply 2x. Okay, and this is a square here. So uh, dxf of 1, 0. That is 2, which is, of course, different from 0. And so I know that I can apply my implicit function theorem. So I know that I have a solution curve, x is x star of lambda, with x star of 0 equal 1, at least for uh, lambda close to 0. And this solution curve is actually this curve here, which of course we can uh, write explicitly in this simple case. So it's x equals square root of 1 minus lambda squared. But the result holds in much more general cases. And, and the point is that I what I mean by a unique continuously differentiable function, it means that it's the unique function in a small neighborhood of this point here. Even though, uh, of course, we, we also have a solution down there. But that is not what we're interested in. Now, one way of uh, understanding this result is to say, let us plot, let us plot f of x 
zero uh, as a function of x, so that is x squared minus one. So that is a function that looks something like that. And here we have our solution, which is at one. And the idea behind this result is that if now lambda changes, f will change. Actually, this parabola will, will move uh, vertically. But we will still have an intersection point if the displacement is not too large. Now, another case would be x equals 0 and lambda equals 1, which is also a solution. So now we are looking at this point over here. And then we observe that dxf of 0 and 1, okay, that is 2 times 0, that is 0. So here I cannot conclude that there is such a curve, and we see y on, on the picture. It is because here locally, for lambda smaller than 1, there are two solutions, and for lambda larger than 1, there's no solution. And we can also understand what happens on a picture like this. If I plot here, so f of x and 1, that is now given by x squared. So it's a parabola like this. So we see the intersection point here. But then, depending on whether we move this parabola up or down, we will have no solution or two solutions. So this is a point where the implicit function theorem does not apply. But these will uh, precisely be particular cases of bifurcation points. So a bifurcation theory uh, is trying to classify uh, all possible bifurcations we have in iterated maps or ordinary differential equations, starting with uh, the simplest ones where we have a fixed point or equilibrium point that maybe changes stability and uh, it can cease to exist or new points can appear. And then uh, there are more complicated scenarios and we will see some examples later on. Now, uh, there are a, a number of tools that allow to analyze these bifurcation points and today I want to talk about one of them, which is quite useful for these systems with uh, one dimensional variable x and one parameter lambda. So this is called Newton's polygon and it works as follows. So let me assume that I want to solve the equation f of x lambda is equal to zero. Let me assume that f is actually a polynomial. So this assumption is not necessary. You can replace polynomial by uh, convergent series expansions. So f could contain maybe exponentials or trig functions or things like that. It even works with some restrictions in cases where f does not admit an infinite number of derivatives. But let us just look at this simple case. So where it is some sum over n and m positive of some coefficients a and m times x to the n lambda to the m. So what this means is that it looks like this a 0 0 plus a 1 0 times x plus a 0 1 times lambda plus then I will have terms like a 2 0 x square a 1 1 times lambda x and a 0 2 times lambda square and so on. So 
Now, uh, what we are uh, interested in here is cases where f of 0, 0 is equal to 0. And that means that a not not will be equal to 0. And now we know by the implicit function theorem that if the uh, derivative of f at 0, 0 is different from 0, then we have a unique uh, branch of, of uh, solutions in the neighborhood of 0, 0. And we are interested in the case where this is not the case, so this derivative should also be 0, and that means that this a 1, 0 is also equal to 0. So actually in my expansion we are interested in cases where these two terms are absent. Now, uh, what is called Newton's polygon? So, let me make a picture. So I have, let me draw two axes, and I put n on one axis and m on the other, and I have somehow a uh, graduation here, one, two, three, four, and so on. One, two, three, and so on. And let me mark dots where A and M is different from zero. So some coefficients, perhaps many coefficients in this expansion up here could be equal to zero. But let me mark some which are not equal to zero. And uh, so it could be uh, maybe a uh, one, two is different from zero, and maybe a uh, two, zero is different from zero, and maybe a, uh, maybe this one is different from, from zero. Uh, maybe this one is different from zero, and so on. So I have a certain set of points here, and then I draw what is we call the convex envelope. So it will be it will consist in so I have a certain polygon like that. But then I'm going actually to uh, complete it by a vertical here. So parts of, of the axis, so the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. And the Newton polygon is the boundary of this shaded area here. So it contains here the following pieces, so the vertical here, these two diagonal lines and the horizontal here. So this is called the Newton polygon. And the, the point is that this polygon allows us to graphically describe solutions of this equation here, f of x lambda equals 0, near the uh, point zero, 0, So the claim is the following. So if my equation f equals 0 admit, admits a solution of the form x is some constant c, different from 0, times, uh, so absolute value of lambda to some exponent mu, times 1 plus a remainder r of lambda that goes to 0, as uh, lambda goes to 0, then Newton's polygon must have a segment of slope minus mu. So it's not an equivalence. It, doesn't mean that if the polygon has a segment of slope minus mu, then we will have a solution like that, but it works in, in one direction. So let us look at an example first. So let us look at the case where uh, f of x lambda is equal to a01 times lambda plus a2, 0 times x squared. And then I 
may have more terms like uh, maybe a11 lambda x and possibly more but okay let us stop it at this mm -hmm. so i'm looking for uh, solutions of that and let me draw newton's polygon here so newton's polygon looks like this so if I put my graduations here, so what the, uh, do I have as uh, non-zero uh, coefficients? So I have zero one, which is the one here. I have two zero, which is the one here, and I have one one, which is the one here. So Newton's polygon will look like this. So it will have a, a diagonal part like that. And here's the interior of the polygon and the polygon consists of these uh, three sides here. And you see that the slope here of this part is equal to minus one half. So the claim is that solutions of f equals zero must be of the form uh, x is proportional to lambda, absolute value of lambda to the one half times uh, one plus the remainder. So let us see why this is the case. So let us make an ansatz of the form x is c times lambda to uh, to the one half times one plus r of lambda and let me plug this in uh, in my f so f of x lambda so the first term will be a zero one times lambda the second one will be a two zero so x square that will be c squared times lambda times 1 plus r and then I will have a11 c lambda times absolute value of lambda uh, to the one half times uh, 1 plus r and I forgot a square here so uh, now let us assume first that lambda is positive. So in that case, I have lambda here, I have lambda here, and here I have lambda to the 3 half. And let us divide the whole relation by lambda. So this should be equal to 0. So I divide everything by lambda, so a0, 1 plus a two zero c squared times one plus r squared plus a one one c and uh, lambda to the one half one plus r should be equal to zero. And now if we let lambda be equal to zero so I take this and I let lambda go to zero, then actually uh, this r will vanish, this r will vanish, and also this lambda to the one half. So what I get is a zero one plus a two zero c squared is equal to zero. And depending on the signs of a zero one and a two zero, this equation may or may not have solutions for C. So that is for lambda positive and for lambda negative, the only thing that changes is a sign somewhere. So you will have a similar equation, but with a different sign. So if you don't have a solution for lambda positive, you may have one for lambda negative. All right. So. That was uh, an example of how this works. 
So now let me give you an idea just of the proof. Not It's not the general proof, but let me uh, look at the case where uh, I have three terms. So f of x lambda is equal, okay, let me just call the coefficients a, b, c. So it's a times x to the n1, lambda to the m1, plus a similar term with b and uh, coefficients n2 and m2, and similarly with c. And let me look for a solution of f equals 0, so this should be equal to 0, of the form x is equal to c times lambda to some power mu times 1 plus r of lambda. And now we can always assume, given a certain mu, that we have the following inequalities, so mu n1 plus m1 is smaller or equal than mu n2 plus m2 is smaller or equal than the same th thing with n3 and m3. And let me also assume that lambda is positive, and then I can do a similar argument for negative lambda. And let us look at our equation. So 0, f should be 0, and this is given by a. So I replace x to the n1 by x expression. I get this. And then I get some power of lambda, which is mu n1 plus m1. And then I get... 1 plus the remainder to the power n1. And I, I get two uh, similar terms with uh, b and c. So let me not write it out completely. And now let us make two things. So thanks to this relation here, I can divide everything by this power of lambda. So I divide by lambda to the power mu n1 plus m1. And then I let lambda go to 0. And then what I get is the equation 0 is a c to the n1 plus b c to the n2 times lambda to some power, which is mu n2 plus m2 minus mu n1 minus m1, and plus a similar term with n3 and m3. And, uh, well, actually, I should put limits when lambda goes to zero of these things. So, it's so actually this one and this one. Uh, so, I I should write, <coughs> let me write it here. I should write limit when lambda goes to zero of this thing here. So now you see one thing, which is that, so the, the exponent here is positive. So, so this is positive or zero. But if it's strictly positive, then uh, as lambda goes to zero, I will find a times c to the n1 is zero, so c is zero. 
And this I don't want. I, I want a non-zero C. So, so actually, I see that C, I can find a solution with C different from zero only if actually the exponent of lambda here is equal to zero. So I have mu n2 plus n2, which should be equal to mu n1 plus m1. And similarly for, for this one, so this one is allowed to be positive, or it could be equal to, to zero, so both are allowed. Now what this means in terms of Newton's polygon is that, so let me assume I have here my point n1, n1, and here somewhere my point n2, m2, and uh, here my point n3, m3. So what this means is that if I connect these two, so this equality here means that here I should have a slope of minus mu. Right, so you can uh, solve this for mu and uh, it will tell you that minus mu is the slope here. And uh, the other condition that this uh, so so mu n three plus m three should be larger equal to mu n one plus m one. That tells you that the point n three m three should be above the line through the two points, the first and the second point here. So this tells you, because now the Newton polygon here will be, so you will have a triangle like this and you will compute it by horizontal and vertical lines. So it tells you exactly the result of the theorem. And then you can extend this to more points, but it's always the, the same argument. So <clears throat> let us finish with a few examples, because it will show us the, some cases of the most important bifurcation. So first of all, let us look at f of x lambda is equal to x square minus lambda plus some terms of higher order. So that is actually what we have already seen, a particular case. And it's the most generic case that can happen if we have a bifurcation point. So then our Newton polygon will have points here at 2, 0 and at 0, 1, so it will look like this, and here I have a slope which is equal to minus 1 half, so mu should be equal to 1 half, and so I know that x should be of the form c times lambda to the 1 half times 1 plus r. So now I plug this in, so for lambda positive I get, uh, so x square that is c squared times lambda times 1 plus r squared minus lambda plus higher order term should be equal to 0. So I can divide everything by lambda. And uh, let lambda go to 0. And then I get the condition c squared equals 1. So I get actually two solutions, c equal plus or minus one. And if lambda is negative, I get uh, so minus c square uh, lambda minus lambda equal zero. So I divide by lambda and I get c squared equals minus 1, 
and then therefore I have no solution. So the signs of the coefficients in my uh, expansion of f will tell me whether or not I have particular solutions. So what happens here is the, the following thing. So if I plot lambda here and x here, I will actually have two uh, curves. So one of them like this, that goes like minus square root, and one of them going like plus square root. Up to a correction one plus r. And if, for instance, we look at the differential equation, so x dot is f of x lambda, then you can check by this condition on derivative that this one is stable and this other one is unstable. So this is called saddle node or fold bifurcation. So fold because of the shape here of uh, it's like a fold and saddle node because actually uh, an unstable point in general dimension uh, is typically a saddle and uh, a stable point is typically what is called a node. Now my second example will be f of x lambda is equal to lambda x minus x square plus lambda square plus higher order terms. So now what are the points in the Newton's polygon? So I have I have points 2, 0, 1, 1 and 0, 2. So that's the Newton polygon. So I know that mu has to be equal to 1. And uh, then if I plug in, so here I don't have to uh, distinguish the cases lambda positive and lambda negative. So what I just say is that, so I write x is c times lambda times 1 plus r. And I plug this into my f, and so I get c lambda square minus c square lambda square plus lambda square plus higher order terms are equal to zero. I divide out the lambda squares and I get the equation c minus c square. Okay, let me write it as uh, so I'm just confused about the sign, so uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, that should be correct. So uh, c square minus c minus 1 equals 0, if I didn't uh, mess up uh, with the signs. And I actually find the uh, two possible solutions. And so what happens is that if I put lambda here and x here, I will actually have two branches which have a non-zero slope and if you look at the stability find something that, that looks like this. So with the same color code for stable and unstable. So we have this exchange of stability and this is called uh, transcritical bifurcation. And actually, the very first example I gave for this logistic map, so where the two branches at 0 and 1 minus 1 over lambda intersect, that was an example of a transcritical bifurcation. Then 
Another example would be the example f of x lambda is lambda x minus x to the 3 plus higher order terms. And let me assume that actually I can factor out x. So it's of the form x times lambda minus x squared plus higher order terms. Now here we immediately see that we have, uh, so x equals zero will be a solution. And let us just look at what Newton's polygon does. So it looks like this. So I have a point in two zero, uh, no, uh, three zero. So here I have three. So I have a point here. I have another point here. And okay, here the convention is that actually Newton's polygon will look like this. So, and here we see that one possible value of mu is one half. Now, in the case here, x equals zero is, is a bit special, so it would correspond actually to a segment with an infinite slope here. So mu is infinity that corresponds to x equals zero. And if you plot the bifurcation curve, so you do the same thing as before, you make this ansatz, you insert, you solve for c, and then you also look at the stability, what you will find in this case is that the zero solution is first stable and then unstable, and the non-zero solution there's a square root solution that appears for positive lambda, and that one is stable. And this is called the pitchfork bifurcation. because of the shape of these curves here. And this, well, it's not so generic because we have no term in uh, x square in our expansion. It actually turns up quite often when there's a symmetry because this could be the case if there is a x minus x symmetry in my function f. And as a last example, let me just give another case where we also have a pitchfork bifurcation. So let me just take the particular case f of x lambda is lambda x minus lambda square minus x to the 3. So in this case, what are the points in my Newton polygon? So I have the point 1, 1, which is here. I have the point 0, 2, and I have the point 3, 0. So the polygon looks like this. And now you see that I have two possible values for mu. So I have mu equals 1, which is this segment here. And for that one, so I make the ansatz x as c times lambda times 1 plus the remainder. And so what I get is C, so let me just not write the R anymore because it will go to zero anyway. So I find C lambda square minus lambda squared minus C cube lambda cube, which should be equal to zero. And so I can divide by lambda squared. And so I find when lambda goes to zero, I find that C is equal to one. And the, the other possibility is mu equals one half that corresponds to this segment here. And then I get x equals c times, okay, and let's look at lambda positive like this. And then I get c times lambda to the three half minus lambda squared 
minus c cube lambda to the 3 half equals 0. So I can divide by lambda to the 3 half here and here. Here I get 1 half and I find that c minus c cube equals 0. So I find c is plus minus 1. So in this case, how do my branches look? So, okay, you can check that for negative lambda there is no solution. So the branches look like this, lambda x. So for lambda negative, I have one branch which is stable. This branch also exists for positive lambda, but it is unstable. And then I have two stable branches that go like square root of lambda that emerge for positive lambda. So this is again the pitchfork bifurcation, but it's asymmetric. So that one is maybe not so, uh, I don't see that often, but it can appear. So it's an asymmetric pitchfork bifurcation. So what we have seen here is a way to study this equation of, a, of a f of x lambda equals zero that gives us a fixed point or stationary equilibrium points for an ODE. And some examples of bifurcations, which are actually the ones you see most often in dimension one. And this Newton polygon is a useful method to study these bifurcation points. So in the next lecture, in part two, I'm going to talk about another method that is called normal forms, normal form analysis. And we are going to see a few more uh, complicated examples that you can't analyze so easily with this Newton polygon. All right, so that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for watching and see you soon. Bye. Take care.